KUAM News Headlines is presented by Calvo's Insurance, a legacy of trust, serving Micronesia since 1938. Matson and the Adahi Tunnel Program. Cars Plus, home of Guam's first and only lifetime limited powertrain warranty. McDonald's of Guam, I'm loving it, and King's Restaurants, always open, always local, and serving up favorites for over 40 years. Ahead on primetime, the total of COVID-related casualties is now at 63. Plus, the Guam Memorial Hospital sees an increase in hospitalizations. And in a week, Dodea teachers and students will be making their way back into the classroom. Off and good evening, everyone. Guam marked its 62nd and 63rd COVID-related fatalities. Yesterday, a 58-year-old man died at the Guam Memorial Hospital at around 5.55 p.m. He was a known positive case who was admitted to the hospital on September 14th. And early this morning, a 51-year-old man passed away. According to the Joint Information Center, the man had underlying health conditions and was admitted to GMH on September 4th as a known positive. Governor Leon Guerrero saying, quote, Scripture tells us that even in the midst of mourning, we should not let our hearts be troubled, nor should we be afraid. We must remain unwavering in our resolve to protect each other from this virus because we must be the front lines in this fight. And out of 571 samples recently run through local labs, 86 people returned positive for COVID-19. Guam's case count is now 3,427. 1,072 cases are in active isolation and 2,294 are recovered. Of the 86 new cases, 32 were identified through contact tracing. And the number of hospitalizations continues to soar at the Guam Memorial Hospital. As Joan Uggen Charferis reports, it was peaking at just over 60 COVID patients this morning. No matter how high the numbers rise, Guam Memorial Hospital Administrator Lillian Posada says they're doing everything they can to provide patient care to COVID and non-COVID patients. We don't have much of a choice but to manage and to handle. The total census to include non-COVID patients at GMH as of Friday morning was 150, and of that number, 62 patients are receiving care for COVID. 12 are receiving ICU level of care, and four are on ventilator support. Of the 62, eight are at the GMH Skilled Nursing Unit in Barragata Heights, also referred to as the COVID Isolation Facility, or SIF. The goal, according to Posadas, is to try to keep COVID patients off ventilators. Posadas says, at the direction of GMH Medical Director Dr. Jolene Uggen, they have stood up a robust proning program. Where every two hours, these individuals are proned, are put in a proning position that will help them uh, with their lungs, open up their lung capacity, so that way they get better um, aeration and oxygenation, so they don't get to the point where their lung tissues continue to collapse and need to be on ventilator. Proning is described as a process of turning a patient with precise, safe motions from their back onto their stomach so the individual is lying face down. It reportedly leads to better breathing. There is that uh, approach and that strategy that Dr. Ogden has launched with a team of um, you know, support staff who go to every room and turn, put patients in a proning position. So hopefully that that will continue to help these individuals uh, pull through this uh, COVID infection and not need to be on ventilator support. Aside from the proning approach, Posada says they are continuing to work on increasing nurse staff. 10 nurses picked up through their staffing solutions agency will arrive to Guam on Sunday and GMH is continuing efforts to recruit more nurses here at home. And we've met with the uh, public health who now has the authority and the oversight uh, uh, responsibility of the DOE nurses. So we're in communication with them to try and, you know, maximize the, their availability in the hospitals, both GMH and GRMC. As the numbers rise, everyone is urged to do their part by wearing a mask, practicing social distancing, and staying safer at home. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Jonah Gancharfris. Over in the CNMI last night, another three people tested positive for COVID-19. The new cases were identified by travel screening and confirmed diagnosis upon arrival. The individuals are now in an isolation faci facility for close monitoring, and the Commonwealth Health Corporation has initiated contact tracing, including passengers on the same flight. This brings the total amount of confirmed COVID-19 cases in the CNMI to 80. Overall, though, the CNMI's case positivity rate remains very low compared to Guam. 
Governor Ralph Torres' spokesman Kevin Bautista was a guest today on The Link Show. He explained that the strict travel and quarantine protocol for arriving visitors has allowed them to keep about 90% of their economy open. I think a lot of luck is involved, but I think putting in the work at the beginning of it to get to this point where we're able to, where I was able to get go to a bar on Saturday, yeah. you know? Socially distanced, of course, we had some, there was, there was some dividers like left and right within the bar as mandated by our, our COVID-19 task force and our ABTC folks. But to have this opportunity to achieve some sort of, some sense of normalcy um, within our community, I think is, is a blessing. Bautista does say, however, that the Imperial Pacific Casino, which was a major contributor to government revenues, still remains closed and the Commonwealth remains on a nighttime curfew. Back here at home, the wife of a port employee speaking out on her frustration with a contact tracing process. Peter Santos reports. As we recently reported, there are now a total of 15 Port Authority employees who have tested positive for COVID. Nicole Flores, the wife of a port employee, took to the link this morning, sharing her thoughts on the contact tracing process. He got a phone call from HR that um, one of his co-workers tested positive over the weekend. And so uh, they told him that um, they're going to schedule him for a COVID testing. And now we're here. As her and her husband wait in line at Public Health's Northern Region Health Center for their COVID test, Nicole asked why it took so long to get tested in the first place. What's frustrating is we got the call Monday and we're only going to get tested today. And everyone was getting sick day by day by day. And it's crazy because we have to wait that long to get tested. And then you want your poor employee to come to work after getting tested until you get the results. Directives from the Department of Public Health and the Joint Information Center encourage those who may have been exposed to get tested and quarantine for a 14-day period. But General Manager of the Port Authority of Guam, Roy Respicio, says things are a little different when it comes to port employees. Unfortunately, we don't have that um, ability here at the port. We're following the Center for Disease Control's guidelines for critical infrastructure that basically says for as long as you're not sick, for as long as you're not positive, uh, you come to work because of the essential nature of the Port Authority. 90% of the goods coming to the island come to the port and we cannot even afford to shut down, not even for a day, uh, much less several days, much less 14 days. On the link this morning, Flores was critical of public health's contact tracing efforts. Public health is not doing the contact tracing. It's the people itself then reporting it to HR after HR, I really don't know what's going on because we have to backtrack who's our surrounding. General Manager Respicio cleared things up, noting that the port's contact tracing team has been in contact with public health in regards to possible exposures with public health scheduling tests at the appropriate times. When Ms. Flores was talking about not being contacted by public health, I really think that that's a disservice to uh, public health because public health wouldn't have contacted her because she's... Is she, for all intents and purposes, what has she been exposed to? But I could tell you, though, that if, God forbid, on the, on the event that the husband, if he's positive, then public health contact tracers will step in uh, and contact and make contact with her, uh, other members of her household. Uh, Respicio says that the Port Authority is taking all the necessary precautions to mitigate the spread of COVID within the port, enforcing strict COVID protocols. Respicio also commended Nicole for her courage in speaking out, adding that it's messages like these that keep us vigilant. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Peter Santos. One of the most alarming developments announced at the governor's press conference yesterday was over the rise in hospitalizations. As we noted earlier in the show, every day we continue to reach new highs, and that's putting a strain not just on the ability to treat COVID patients, but on the entire health care system. Governor's Physician Advisory Group member Dr. Felix Cabrera says, by comparison, the peak hospitalization during the first wave was about 25 patients. We've nearly tripled that, and it's expected to get worse. We're looking at, you know, reaching 100, you know, triple digits anywhere from two to four weeks from now. Uh, and that's, um, you know, that, that's very concerning. And we have to remember, that's just the COVID-19 patients. 
Hospitals still have to make space for all the other critical cases, cancer patients, heart attack victims. Dr. Cabrera says that's why it's critical to contain the spread. And as he urged during the press con, people who feel sick should stay home and isolate. In particular, the data shows workplace infections have more than doubled in the past month, most likely when employees congregate during breaks. I want to make a plea to every business, every uh, workplace, every area to please Please refrain from, from uh, having potlucks. Please refrain from, from eating uh, your meals together. Meanwhile, PAG Chairman Dr. Ho Awen says equally alarming is the case positivity rate. Seriously, guys, this is probably uh, the most serious time that we have since March. The positivity rate is currently about 14 percent, the highest in many weeks. And Dr. Wen says it can be tracked to continued family gatherings. I wish we can just do that for two to three weeks of, you know, uh, stay put, you know, go to work, go home and not go to another family to, to gather or to celebrate or to mingle just for two to three weeks. And we will do very well to, to get out of this uh, high number. Otherwise, he says, it may be time to get tougher on those who continue to ignore the social distancing protocol. We gotta find people. You know, um, given warning now, I understand we're giving thousands of warning already. Uh, warning have no teeth. It certainly hasn't changed a lot of people's behavior, says the good doctor, and maybe a smack to the wallet will. Testing by DPHS's rapid engagement team continued today at the Zero Down and Gil Baza areas in Jigo. Yesterday, public health reported 48 out of 124 or 39% of tests were positive for COVID-19. According to Public Information Officer Janela Carrera, during yesterday's engagement, they observed multiple households with small one to two bedroom units with many people living inside. Some households where there were, you know, uh, 10 plus people living in one unit. Uh, there were some compounds where there were um, two to three uh, homes in one compound right, you know, right next to one another. And so those were some of the observations that we made yesterday. Carrera adds that the average age of those infected was mid-20s. Public Health reiterates multi-generational homes are at high risk for infection. Tomorrow, drive through testing is scheduled at the Jigo Gym. Carrera says they are offering 200 tests and will be working closely with the SBSM consulate. In other news, the Superior Court has denied the government's motion for reconsideration in a case that challenged the mandatory 14-day quarantine for arriving passengers. Eugene Igros was one of the first petitioners to challenge the requirement to stay in a GovGuam facility. The court ruled in his favor last month after determining it was not voluntary. According to the decision and order, the government did not bring forward evidence of a voluntary quarantine form. The conditions the Igros family agreed to, whether they agreed to a certain duration, if there were opportunities to seek testing, or if they were allowed to seek legal counsel. The decision states that, quote, DPHSS simply failed to meet the burden of proving what voluntary quarantine meant in that instance. Stick around for more news here on Primetime. You're watching KOAM. Get up to the minute news, plus access to alerts, streaming radio, promotions, and more on your mobile device by downloading the KUAM News mobile app, available at the App Store now. Welcome back. This week's Touch of Class. Social distancing may be the new norm, but connection will always be our tradition. Through good times and tough times, we remain connected with you. Mass may be the new fashion, but protection will always be our style. You can always count on us to protect the things that matter the most. Sanitizing may be the new routine, but caring will always be our practice. We care about your loved ones and the things you value the most. And as we welcome our new normal, one thing remains certain, we will always be here for you. We're open and ready to serve you. Calvo's Insurance, a legacy of trust.
We are in the middle of the most serious health crisis of our lives, and it affects everything from jobs to schools to the way we live. In addition to worrying about recovery, we must now worry about health care. And we shouldn't have to make choices between food and medicine, going to the doctor, or buying gas. We all need access to health care, and now, more than ever, we need hospitals and clinics which can respond to pandemics. We must get the vaccines and new treatments for COVID-19. We must be ready with ventilators and partnerships with the federal government for our emergency facilities and have pandemic plans which provide a secure safety net. We must be ready for the next crisis. And this takes a leader in Washington who is trustworthy and will work with local leaders and experts. This is why I am running for Congress. I humbly ask you for your vote. Si Jules Ma'asi, maraming salamat po. I'm Robert Underwood, and I approve this message. KUAM News, winner of the 2020 Regional Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Social Media. Welcome back. Dodea school teachers and students will be back in the classroom come October 26. The announcement was made yesterday by Pacific West Community Superintendent Gail Wiley. Meanwhile, in contrast, Guam Department of Education Superintendent John Fernandez has announced that GDOE schools will still not hold face-to-face -face instruction for the second quarter. Here's more. According to a release from Dodea Pacific West, Guam shifted to Health Protection Condition Bravo, triggering the process to transition to the brick-and-mortar learning environment. A notice was sent to McCool staff from Community Superintendent Gail Wiley, outlining the procedures for shifting to in-classroom learning by Monday, October 26. And from October 20th to October 22nd, staff is receiving training on COVID-19 mitigation strategies and protocols and preparation for the students' return. KUAM reached out for an interview, however, Wiley and Dodea Public Affairs Officer Miranda Ferguson were unavailable. Although Ferguson did provide this statement, quote, We know that brick and mortar school looks a bit different in our new normal due to COVID-19. We have numerous mitigation strategies in place for the health and safety of students and employees in line with CDC recommendations and DOD guidance, including social distancing, clear physical barriers in all classrooms and cafeterias, wearing face masks, frequent hand washing, and use of hand sanitizer, and signage reminders for all of these protective measures, unquote. Ferguson adds they understand it will be an adjustment for students to social distance and wear face masks at school, but recognize students are already familiar with these mitigations. She says our students are resilient. We are confident that they will adapt to this new brick and mortar school environment and continue to grow and learn. Meanwhile, Guam Department of Education Superintendent John Fernandez made the announcement that public schools are to continue with distance learning until at least January with the possibility to resume face-to-face -face learning by the third quarter. This morning, Fernandez sent the letter recommending the postponement of in-class learning to the Guam Education Board, seeking their support. He states, quote, based on the CDC framework, we are in the highest risk category based on new cases and positivity rates. For this reason, it is my assessment that any decision to reopen schools in the near future is premature. And even if authorized by the governor, it is my judgment that reopening GDOE schools during second quarter will pose untenable risk to our employees and students, unquote. Fernandez adding they plan to work on strengthening distance learning options for the second quarter. And starting next week, he plans to update the GEB every Friday at 11 a.m. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Adriana Cotero. Can we even convince the jurors to come in? This was a question Judge Arthur Barcinas asked both the defense and prosecution attorneys in the Mark Torrey Jr. case today. While defense counsel Jay Ariola is pushing for the trial to resume, Chief Prosecutor Basil O'Mallon is opposed. O'Mallon informing the court there are at least five jurors who have expressed concerns about returning to the courtroom. The return to pandemic condition of readiness one has placed Torrey's trial on hold since August. He faces negligent homicide and aggravated assault charges for the 2015 fatal shooting of fellow police officer Albert Piolo. The court scheduled a return for Wednesday, October 21st, when arguments are expected to be heard on the motion to further delay the trial. Governor's Deputy Chief of Staff John Jr. Calvo has been officially promoted to Chief of Staff, and Guam Housing Corporation President Alice Tyron has been named Deputy Chief. In making the announcement, the Gov Governor Leon Guerrero said, We've chosen John to help us lead this government at the highest level because he has proven himself to be effective, earnest, honest, and energetic. 
The governor also said Alice is a no-nonsense manager who confronts challenges directly and works to bring people together. Calvo became acting chief after Tony Babauta stepped down earlier this year following a controversy surrounding his stay at the Pacific Star Hotel quarantine facility. Guam Election Commission Executive Director Maria Pangalinen says curbside voting will now take a little longer than before after they found incidences of double voting. Typically, voters would present their ID for screening. During the day when they're not busy, they will screen them to see if they had voted or not. Come election day, all signature rosters will be marked of those who voted early. Pangalinen says the law states that cases such as double voting are to be referred to the Attorney General. In addition, final disclosure statements are due October 19th for public and elected officials. They will be accepted at the GEC under the canopy on the first floor. Pangalinen adds that the deadline for the 2020 general election candidates to turn in their preliminary campaign finance reports is October 23rd. And there will be early voting tomorrow at the Okudu campus, campus in Dededo from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Bring your ID, wear a mask, and bring a blue or black ball pen. At around 11 a.m., units from the Guam Fire Department responded to a structure fire on Chalan Luadzao in Barragada. According to initial reports, the fire started in the carport and made its way into the house through a bay window. The residents were not at home at the time and no injuries were reported. The cause of the fire is under investigation. And in national news, the presidential candidates competed for viewers, each holding town hall events at the same time on different networks. Unlike a formal debate, though, tonight's events allowed voters to ask the questions. Skyler Henry reports from Washington. Instead of sparring on the debate stage, the presidential candidates battled each other through dueling appearances. President Trump in Miami and Joe Biden in Philadelphia. In a town hall moderated by ABC News' George Stephanopoulos, the former vice president attacked the Trump administration's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is a presidential responsibility to lead. And he didn't do that. He didn't talk about what needed to be done because he kept worrying, in my view, about the stock market. In a separate event televised by NBC News, President Trump was asked if he remembered his last negative COVID test. I don't know. I don't even remember. I test all the time. Questions about racial unrest and law and order drew out the candidates' clashing views. And there's a lot of things we can do. We shouldn't be defunding cops. We should be mandating the things that we should be doing within police departments. Why are you asking Joe Biden questions about why doesn't he condemn Antifa? Why does he say it doesn't exist? Because the town hall events replaced what was supposed to be the second debate. After the president tested positive for COVID-19, organizers decided to change the format to virtual. President Trump declined. And again, voters' questions returned to health care. The problem with Obamacare, it's not good. We'd like to terminate it. I think that also health care overall is very much in jeopardy as a consequence of the president's going to go directly after this election directly to the Supreme Court within a month. The final presidential debate is scheduled for next Thursday in Nashville. Organizers say they're hoping for more structure than the first one and less chaos. Skyler Henry, CBS News, Washington. Coming up this week's installment of Touch of Class Virtual Learning Edition. Don't go away. Your community calendar is brought to you by Taco Bell. Whether it's your first meal or your fourth meal, we've got you covered. Taco Bell, live mas. The Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Guam is pleased to announce the grand opening on October 10 at Suite 727 at the Guam International Trade Center. The event marks the 109th National Day of the Republic of China, Taiwan, known as Double Ten Day.
100% truck, 100% Jeep brand. The all-new Jeep Gladiator is the most capable off-road mid-size pickup truck crafted for adventure. Equipped with best-in-class towing capacity, legendary Jeep brand 4x4 capability, and backed by Guam's only lifetime powertrain warranty. Drive home in a brand new Jeep Gladiator today, starting as low as $283 per paycheck during Jeep Adventure Days. Call us at 477-7807 or visit our website at carsplusguam.com to get pre-approved today. We have just one voice representing us in Congress, one person to advocate for all of our needs and tell Guam's story to the nation. That's why I'm running to be Guam's next delegate to Congress, to serve as the kind of representative you deserve. But what does a vote for me guarantee? It's a vote for someone who can tell the Guam story, our sacrifices, our struggles, and our triumphs, and why we matter to America. It's a vote for competency in securing more resources from the federal government, not as a handout, but because we are vital to the country. It's a vote for trustworthiness. Integrity and trust are not optional when representing you. They are required. I thank you for allowing me to serve Guam before, and I humbly ask you for your vote again. I'm Robert Underwood, and I approve this message. Welcome back. This week's Touch of Class Virtual Learning Edition features Mariana Santos of McCool Elementary School. All right, welcome to another uh, segment, A Touch of Class, our teacher feature, as I like to call it, where we are featuring teachers around our island and talking about the, the, the challenges that we're facing in this uh, very, very different school year. And joining me today, we have Mariana Santos. Ms. Santos, half a day and welcome to the show. Half a day for having me. So uh, the word of the year is challenges. And uh, with the, the pandemic and everything that's going on, how have you and your students uh, stepped up to those challenges and what are some of the challenges that you've uh, realized? Um, well, challenge is definitely the correct word to describe <laughs> the year. Um, in, in my particular case, because I'm a special education teacher, so it's, it's, it's challenging to begin with. It's especially challenging when we move to remote instruction, um, you know, my students learn in a different manner um, and remote instruction has just presented its own talents. Um, and, but so far, I mean, since the beginning of this school year, we've been doing what we can to make it work with the support of their parents. They have been amazing and we are doing what we can to rise to the challenge that's right. been occurring. And with a lot of, uh, you know, especially uh, special ed kids, they, they need that personal touch, that hands-on experience uh, to help them uh, process certain things. So uh, how have you kind of gotten around the fact that you just can't be there for them physically? Um, again, it is with a lot of parent support. My parents have been phenomenal. Um, we, what we've done is we've created a consistent schedule for my students. So that way, that kind of helps them in their routine so that they know at a certain time they log on and they're gonna see me through a computer. Their parents are gonna sit right there next to them. Some of the things that actually require um, some hands-on help the parents are right there doing it with them with, um, you know, and as I guide them through it. And so that's kind of been, that's kind of been the big, um, the big factor here is how much I've worked hand in hand with parents to make my students as successful as they can be. Right. And uh, most of the teachers I've talked to have said that, that in this, this year, the way learning is now, they, it would not be possible without the parents uh, taking an active role in their child's education, uh, making sure they stick to the schedule, do the homework when you don't have the teacher hovering over them. So what mm -hmm. do you, what would you like to say to all the, the parents out there and the students uh, as we all try to get through this, uh, you know, one day at a time? Um, thank you. You guys are phenomenal. 
I recognize how hard this is to do, um, to, to do this where which you're trying to, we're trying to teach, but there's only so much we can do without the parent support. And so to my parents, especially, and then to all the parents out there who are at home sitting with their kids, those who have more than one kid. And then in, for my particular case, my parents who have children with special needs, um, you guys are rocking it. Keep doing what you're doing. I know how hard it is. Yeah, and it takes everyone, uh, the students, the parents, everyone, especially the teachers, uh, we're all going to get through this together. We just have to be patient. And uh, we're very, very, very thankful that we have teachers like you, Mariana Santos. Thank you so much. Thank you. Guam's Auto Appearance Specialist, Elegant Reflections, has been providing the automotive industry with professional detailing and car care products at its highest quality from complete detailing, full interior detailing, exterior detailing, headlamp restoration, hand washing, seat and carpet shampoo, engine degreasing, undercarriage cleaning, paint sealant, fabric protection, paint oxidation removal, and so much more. Visit us at our new location. Call 646-5555 for an appointment. Elegant Reflections, Guam's Auto Appearance Specialist, over 20 years of experience. And before we close out the news tonight, our latest round of birthday shout-outs from the Cold Stone Creamery Birthday Club. Happy birthday to Ivy Nadine Mendoza. Happy birthday, Ivy. Enjoy your blessings on your day. Love from your families in all four corners, from the north, east, south, and west. All directions. Awesome. Happy birthday to Jessica Lancy Johnston. We love you and are so happy you are here with us. We love you, say Tanner, Connor, Mom, and Dad. Kainia Grace Roman, happy birthday, Princess. We hope you enjoy your special day. We love you, say Nana, Papa, Mom, Dad, and the family. Ruben Rabanio Jr. celebrates birthday number big four four. Happy birthday, brother, coming from your grandma, your sister, your nieces, your nephew, and the entire family near and far. Happy birthday to Carlos Herrera, who hits the half a hundred mark. Happy birthday 5-0 to Carlos, a.k.a. The Hitman. Cheers to good health and have a blessed day. Love your wife, kitties, and Carson Miguel. Oh, Bret Hart sends you a uh, nice birthday shout-out, too. Woo! The best there ever was, the best there ever will be. <laughs> Carlos Canata, a.k.a. Bull Boy. Happy birthday. May you enjoy your special day. We love you. Love Carson Miguel, Greggy, and Carlos Boy. All right. And happy belated birthday wishes going out to Juwan King. Happy blessed birthday, Jew. We love you unconditionally. Hugs and kisses from mom, Andre, your brothers, and the family. And finally, it's that time of the week where we announce the winner of a delicious Cold Stone Creamery cake. This week's winner is Keith Torres, who was born earlier this week, well, several years ago, on October 11th. So Keith, we are happy Pleased and privileged to give you and your family a happy extended birthday, and we wish you safety, health, and happiness, and we will be in contact with you to let you know how you can safely retrieve your Cold Stone Creamery ice cream cake. Have an extended happy birthday. Please be well, and we'll see you soon. And that's our report for tonight. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a great weekend, and stay safe.